Welcome to Reframe the Podcast, helping you reframe your thought patterns, habits and mindsets to create the life that you want to lead. Today is one of our juiciest and most jam-packed interviews yet. Certified life coach Gabrielle Trinor shares so many wonderful insights and strategies for overcoming the overwhelm and our overthinking tendencies to help us feel calmer, happier and more empowered. We hope you love this episode as much as we do. Hi, Gabrielle, and thank you so much for joining us today at Reframe Club. It is a joy to have you. Um, And I just wonder before we start, could you introduce yourself to our, our members and tell us a little bit more about who you are and what it is exactly that you do? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me on, Rose. It's always lovely to chat with you, and it's lovely to be able to see your face and chat with you today. Um, So I am a mindset and empowerment positive psychology coach, essentially. And how that came about is a rather long, winding road, which I will try not to tell in too long and winding a tale. Um, Essentially, I've been a thinker, a deep thinker my whole life but actually that then spilled into overthinking and over doing and the overwhelm that came with it you know being brought up wanting to be a good girl and do what I'm told and you know be thinking of other people putting them first doing what's expected of me all of that stuff um And the weight that comes with that. And so, you know, I'm a rule follower. I did all the the right things. I, you know, did my GCSEs and I did my A-levels and I went to university and I started on the career ladder and I met a lovely man who is still my lovely man. I got a, you know, mortgage, got a dog, (laughs) did all the things that you're supposed to do. Um, But, you know, years and years of feeling like I needed to make sure that I was living up to everyone else's expectations, worrying about what other people were thinking of me, was I doing the right thing? All of that stuff, after a few decades of that, that starts to weigh really pretty heavy on you. And I think that actually inside, I was beginning to realize that subconsciously and I was beginning to fight back a bit. So I had, my first career was in publishing and in youth magazines. And I just felt this need to do something different. I wanted to do something creative in a different way. It's like I wanted to be creative with my hands. I wanted to make stuff. I wanted to draw and design. And I have never been a very arty type person. It was made clear to me in school that I was not artistic. So I never went down that route. But anyway, and also that didn't go against, that went against the, the good girl of, you know, you start a career and you stay with your career and that's what you do. And you don't go, you know, going part time and starting your own business. That's the whole world of riskiness that you don't you know, you don't go down. But I felt really compelled to do it. So I went down that path and I started my own stationery business, um, designing, producing all my own stationery and selling it online mainly. And then um, I was part-time at my job doing that. And then I decided to completely leave my publishing career and become full-time self-employed that ticked some of the boxes in terms of sort of feeling the need to let go of the pressure from a workplace from you know from a boss um I'm quite far down the introvert end of the introvert extrovert line and so not needing to be doing the commute on the train into London all of that kind of stuff that that helped sort of solve some of that stuff but the the stress and the overwhelm was still there because actually then I was just putting it on myself because then I was my own boss which is great in some ways not in others because the buck stops with you um so those underlying kind of issues were still there and I was still feeling the overwhelm from it all and then I found out about the world of positive psychology literally a section of the bookshop I happened upon and as I started to explore and to to read more it started to make real sense to me and I started to, to practice and try out some of the things that I was reading about to try and just calm my brain down and to, to you know, to challenge the people pleasing tendencies that I had and to question the stories that I was telling myself. And the more that I was learning and the more that it was helping me, the more I was thinking, well, hang on, there's got to be other people who feel like how I do. And therefore, if what's helping me, it's bound to help other people. So it started to really influence my stationary designs. So actually, I was going much more down the path of creating um, stationery that had very positive messaging in it, um, or you know, suddenly sort of accepting language. And I was creating gratitude journals and reflection journals and those kind of things. And as I was getting more and more into this, I was thinking, actually, this is what I want to focus on. 
So I started to create online courses around what I was learning and being able to share it with other people. And then eventually I decided to sell my stationary business so I could focus full time on the well-being side of my work. And I retrained as a life coach. And that is what I've been doing ever since. So I'm continuing, as we all are, works in progress. I'm still continuing to learn, um, you know, and, and help myself while also helping women to overcome all the overwhelm that they feel from the overthinking, the overdoing, so that they can feel more calm and content and confident that they can deal with what's happening in their lives and, and in the world. And, you know, simply to just feel a little bit happier each day. That's wonderful work that you do. And I, I know a lot of people have massively benefited, not least from working with you one-on-one, -on -one, but from the articles you write in many of the publications you write for to just how you generally give over your platform. So I know how amazing your work is. But um, there are some things you were saying then that really kind of resonated. And they resonated with me because they tend to be traits that I see in my own private practice in clients over um, things like tending to be people pleasers, tending to want to conform and feel they have to meet a certain set of expectations around their bodies and how they eat and what they look like, um, and the journey towards acceptance and how kind of diet culture for us, you know, obviously in the work we do at Reframe Club, for us, you know, one of the biggest things that we come up against is diet culture kind of holds you down at the, at the level of, well, you need to conform. And I think conformity and people pleasing and that kind of like herd mentality thing um, really do stop us being able to be free to live the life that's the most fulfilling for us. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Because we're, you're looking outside of yourself the whole time, aren't you? You're looking mm -hmm. outside. What do other people want you to do? What do other people expect from you? What do they think you should be doing? Little red flag of the should word. You know, that's you're looking outside of yourself for approval and for acceptance as opposed to looking to yourself for your own approval and your own acceptance of who you are and what you look like and what you do. Historically, we would have you know those people around us that we looked for look to for approval so we would look to our parents you know as children our peers our work colleagues our friendship groups but now thanks to social media you know we are curating and putting out all the time we're looking for that um, validation from these external voices some of which it was many of whom we'll never even meet um and i think that just goes to complicate it yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. It's, it's that looking for permission. And when you're a kid looking mm. for permission, it makes sense. You're still figuring out what is and isn't OK, you know, how the world works and your relation to it. But as we grow up, we can still get stuck on that. So actually then, and like I say, with social media, we aren't just looking to our bosses for permission or, you know, maybe still to family for permission, friends. We're also looking to complete strangers on the Internet who we don't know and they don't know us. And we're looking to them to see what is acceptable, what is allowed what is considered good, what is considered bad, what, you know, what, what are we allowed to do? And we give that power away to other people who we don't even know, and they don't even know that we're looking to them, possibly for that kind of approval. And of course, some of them are actually actively seeking to try and make us, you know, there's manipulative people wanting us to, to feel like we have to go to them to look for that approval. But all the time, that we're doing that we're just completely losing track of ourselves and losing trust in ourselves and in what is actually right for us and if we've never if we've never really had the opportunity to approve of ourselves and we've always looked outside of ourselves for permission then it's you know it's like a it's like a muscle that we've just never used and therefore it's 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 not very strong but by bit by bit, actually thinking to ourselves, okay, what, what do I want to do? What is right for me? We can strengthen it. I mean, something that I noticed that quite often at the start of um, working with a new one-to-one -one client, a lot of the conversation, they might be saying things like, well, do you think I should do? Or, well, do you think I should do this? And, and what do you think? And do you think I should? And, and I'm like, it's going to be really annoying in coaching, but what do you think? What do you want to do? And sometimes they're like, oh, I, I just want you to tell me I'm like, it's not what a coach does mm. I'm going to help you let's figure it out together 
but it's really important for you to get that muscle going, to get that muscle working and figure out what is it that you want to do. And actually, you see the change in somebody's face. I mean, you'll totally experience this, won't you, where you see the change in somebody's face where they're like, actually, actually, I think I know what I want to do. At least I want to have a go at it. And maybe that's not going to be the right thing, but I'm going to try. And there's this lightness. There's a little bit of straightening up happens. There's a bit of lightness comes up in their face that they think, no, I, yeah, do you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to decide what I do. And it's so empowering. And it, you know, it doesn't mean that you're always going to make the right decision, but at least it's yours as opposed to you're doing what somebody else is telling you to do or what you think they want you to do. And that's so disempowering. Massively, massively disempowering. And I think we have outsourced. That's how I, I experience it um, with the people I work with. It's this kind of outsourcing of their trust and intuition. And they've, they've lost um, a sense of, um, you know, um, what movement feels good or actually how do I want to spend my free time and relax how do I what food do I enjoy eating as they sit there trying to chug down a kale and spirulina smoothie because the expert in the room told them that that's what they should be doing and yeah that sense of um, being able to trust that you we have all the capabilities already within us we have all the knowledge we need already within us but we have outsourced it to an app on our phone or a tracker on our wrist uh, tells us, well, you've still not done enough steps. So if you could just jog by your bed to close the rings by the end of today, then you are validated as a human being. Um, yeah, absolutely, massively. And how do you th think that kind of lack of, or that loss maybe of trust in ourselves or that intuitiveness in our um, own, um, capabilities affects our health because obviously for you you know the work you work in you know like us at reframe we don't believe health is you know how much you move and what you eat it's far more encompassing than that isn't it yeah yeah i mean i yeah to me health is it's it's all of it so it's physical and it's mental and it's emotional it's the whole shebang and if you if you've got one bit of it working brilliantly but the others you've ignored you're still not in a place of great optimal health are you i mean i've like i said at the start you know i've always been a thinker and in the past i've been described as cerebral which i took as a compliment and actually i realized that that's not actually a great compliment although it might be intended that way but to be in my head all the time meant that a lot of time i was cut off from my body and therefore actually there wasn't a lot going on in terms of how i was taking care of all of me i was just you know i was in my head a lot thinking and so what I try to do far more now is to really consciously think about it, but to get in tune with what's going on in my body. Because if I'm, if I'm not listening to me, then I'm not realizing that actually, you know, my shoulders are up here and therefore I get the end of the day. And no wonder, you know, I roll my shoulders and it's just all cracking. Or no wonder there's an ache. Or, you know, actually, you know, I, I'm not able to really get in touch with my, my gut and my intuition because you know, I'm just I'm cut off here. And so how can I be accessing my full optimal health if nothing's happening from the neck down because I'm not paying any attention to it, I'm completely and utterly out of tune with it. So, you know, the, <laughs> the cerebral person that I am, I think, all right, well, how am I gonna get to do that? So I personally will actually kind of set alarms and I'll set an alarm, the alarm will go off and I will stop and I will think, pay attention I would go from thinking to feeling right how do I feel what is happening in my body now actually I've just noticed I'm my stomach's rumbling I'm hungry when did I last eat oh I haven't eaten for ages when did I last have a glass of water when did I last move and it's trying to get that in tune and I think that you know also somebody who is very much about going on with their body you know and they they focus on what they eat and they focus on how they move but they don't perhaps give any of the the thinking time to or any of their active time to how are they feeling that you know it's that it's the opposite but it can be just as unhelpful to you because it could be that you're actually holding up all kinds of thoughts and feelings that if you were to be able to access them and to to talk them through and to release them then that would help you to reach the the health that you want to reach too yeah, absolutely and as you say it is it is mind and emotion and physicality they're also highly interconnected and you know you said they're about taking the opportunity to to check in and literally setting an alarm 
And sometimes that is an action that I will give someone is or a post-it note on their screen to check in, you know, am I hungry? Am I, because we're so busy, you know, we, we, the overwhelm's up here, but also the overwhelm is coming at all these rocks that are thrown at us in the day, you know, the email notification, your phone going, the kids coming in, you know, the phone call is it's quite, and then almost um, prevents you taking those opportunities you have to carve them out you have to create until they become habitual and it becomes something that you're doing you know automatically you know we we do we have to take that time to say no i'm going to stop and how do i feel and, and as you said you know i'm hungry or i'm i'm actually feeling really frustrated and anxious and sometimes what will happen for clients that i work with is that they've spent so long kind of at the coal face you know doing 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 and they've become so detached from the physiological symptoms of hunger, for example, or that they ignore their hunger all day and then they find themselves eating very rapidly in the evening. Or equally as common, they will find themselves completely subconsciously standing in front of the fridge, for example. And when we begin to unpick what's been happening, it's because throughout the day there's been this anxiety growing anxiety or they've just seen that email and what they're seeking is to distract or numb because they haven't made space to allow that feeling to be there because there is no space there's no time there's no gaps there's i mean you must experience that with your clients too the kind of just the rapidity the, the speed at which we live our lives now is phenomenal yeah absolutely and i think that something that has come out of this lockdown time has been some of, you know, some of that business has gone, some of that business has changed, but the ways that we used to numb ourselves, some of those, some of those have gone because actually, you know, it, it could be that the literally literal running around, getting the kids to and from their activities, going to the pub, doing, you know, meetings, all of the busy, 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 some of that has gone and therefore I think some people have found it quite challenging to then have this space because then they have had time to think and some people don't want to think because when they think unwanted thoughts appear unwanted feelings appear and they don't know what to do with them because they haven't had to deal with them because they've kept themselves busy all the time either through you know busy work busy family busy social life whatever but actually when you stop and you you then see those thoughts and those feelings and they don't feel very great then what do you do with them and that can be yeah that can be really challenging as to how you start to approach them and the, the first thought can then be well i'll just distract myself with something else so i will go to the fridge or i will you know turn on netflix i will get out instagram and you know distract myself in some other way but those those thoughts those feelings were always there you just were covering them up and they are going to be there until you do something with them until you look at them and it doesn't mean that you have to you know you have to look at them and you have to deal with them all right now but it can just be you know a fact of actually just acknowledging okay this is how i'm feeling right now and i don't like feeling like this oh okay i'm just going to give myself a couple minutes to just feel it doesn't feel comfortable maybe take a few breaths talk to a friend go for a walk whatever it is that i can do to help me right now and then i'm going to do something else you don't have to you know when you've recognized that feeling it doesn't mean like right i now need to go on to like a full-on self psychotherapy session and figure it all out that would be really overwhelming <laughs> let's not add to the overwhelm but it's you know but just instantly going don't like the feeling push it away shove shove go away that isn't yeah that's not going to resolve it it's just going to keep bouncing back at you no and i think that is something that i think we all could do well with practicing but it does feel really alien when you first start allowing to sit with your feelings and just acknowledge that they're there you know, do you know what? and name it yeah i do feel i feel what i'm experiencing now is anxiety or i do feel sad or i you know that can actually as you say be a really difficult passage to go through but but just allowing yourself the, you know it's the, it's the leaf floating down the river there it is i see it and i'm just gonna let it be here and then pass on through and the more you can yeah. do that the more you can begin to explore it but as you say the first step is most definitely allowing yourself the space to feel it isn't it and i think i think we think that if we notice that leaf flowing down the river we don't think that it's going to flow on and just float off we think if we haven't had if we haven't given ourselves the space to think about our feelings and to to allow ourselves to feel them 
then we we don't really know what they're going to do and we think well this is you know i will never stop feeling this feeling if i allow myself to feel sad i am never ever going to stop feeling sad oh my god what on earth would i do with that or you know this anxious feeling is going to completely overpower me or the anger that i feel is going to run away with me and i won't be able to control my anger but actually that generally speaking isn't the case actually when you you notice the feeling it's just there and it's not comfortable but it doesn't actually suddenly become this massive scary monster that completely and utterly overpowers you if anything actually the opposite happens you notice it this is uncomfortable i don't like this still uncomfortable okay well i i'm all right well i'm still here nothing bad has happened okay okay ah, the leaf is beginning to float past me and then once you've done that a couple of times you realize that actually those feelings that you were pushing away and not allowing yourself to have the thoughts that just felt too scary and you didn't want to look at actually when you look at them in the face so to speak as opposed to them just sort of hovering on the periphery the whole time they aren't actually as big and scary and as uncontrollable as you originally thought and then once you recognize that, then the next time they come up, they aren't, they might still be a bit kind of daunting, but they are as daunting because it's like, okay, I've done this. Actually, I've, I've had this before and the world didn't end and I didn't end up a complete blubbering mess on the floor. So I'm probably going to be all right again. And that, again, is that back to that empowerment, isn't it? It's back to you, to you feeling like, okay, actually, I am not at the mercy of my thoughts and my feelings. All right. Okay. This is okay. That feels, that feels better. It's, it's really interesting hearing you say that as well. I mean, it's such a, a powerful way of describing it. Um, and I kept hearing the word in my own head, permission, as you were saying it, because there's a correlation between what you're saying there about this fear that if I let open the door a chink, it's going to overwhelm me, it's going to run away, I'm going to be on the floor, I'm never going to come back from it. And a lot of people who have spent their years kind of... Um, in battle with food and dieting and they have good foods and bad foods and they put them into these categories and they have foods that they deem forbidden you know this these are the no-go foods the when we talk about unconditional permission so in that we're talking about allowing ourselves to experience that food the fear that comes out is that i will lose control around that food so i cannot have Nutella, for example, or I cannot have bread because I'm fearful that once I open the floodgates, it will never stop. And I will never, you know, there's no coming back and then it's all ruined and I will just, everything will forever and ever and ever be terrible. And, and it, it's, it, again, it's like that. It's, as you said, it's about allowing, giving ourselves permission and realizing the more we expose ourselves, the more we allow ourselves to sit within and experience that food or that emotion the less power it holds and the more empowered we are to be in control of that situation. Um, and that's probably one of the most um, empowering steps that I take. We call it, we call it habituation in the world of intuitive eating. Um, and I guess it's the same. It's becoming habituated to sitting with and experiencing emotions and knowing that we survive it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very similar. We talk about self-care. You talk a lot about self-care in your work and what, those acts are and why they're important and it's not spa days is it it's as wonderful as they are <laughs> but you know what is accessible and what is what does caring for ourselves really mean and why is that so important in the context of um, feeling empowered and having a positive mindset yeah self-care <clears throat> it's not just bubble baths and lighting candles lovely as they might be to people who like to light candles and have bubble baths um i think it, it encompasses so much it encompasses how we talk to ourselves that's a big one because we all have you know the little inner monologue going on all the time and a lot of the time that little voice that is chattering away to us not very kind not very supportive you know it's a little voice that's saying you shouldn't eat that what do you think you're doing? I mean, don't, what do you, you know, and why are you wearing that? Do you know what you look like? I can't believe that you haven't been for a run today. You are the most awful person. You've never, oh, you know, the things that they say just can be really, really hurtful. So noticing the words that we're using to ourselves and, and thinking, well, actually, 
would I say that to my friend? Would I allow my friend to say that to me? No. So why am I saying that to myself? And sometimes I think we can think that we need to have a little bit of a sergeant major in our, in our heads to, you know, to, to, you know, get us going, you know, to, to kick us up the bum. And to a point it does that, but actually that only works for a shorter period of time because then, you know, then eventually you rebel against that sergeant major because you just don't want to hear them anymore. So I think noticing what we're saying to ourselves is really important and, and just being a bit kinder, you know, bringing in some self-compassion and thinking about, you know, the way that you are with other people, that's how you can be with yourself. You know, again, permission, you are allowed to be nice to yourself. You're allowed to be kind and caring for yourself. Um, Honouring your boundaries is another way of practising self-care. You know, what is all right with you and what is not all right with you? What are your values? If, you know, if one of your values is kindness, then that needs to be not only how you are to other people, but how also you accept kindness from other people. And if other people aren't being kind to you, then they are, you know, they are going against one of your core values. And therefore, how can you honor your boundaries to not allow that unkindness in? And also it goes for yourself. If kindness is one of your values, you need to be kind to yourself too. Um, yeah, there's just, there's, self-care is just such a, it's such a big topic. There's so, it's, it's everything that we do for ourselves and to ourselves. It's, it, you can never compartmentalize it into one certain thing. And the thing that when, when we take care of ourselves, it helps us to, to value ourselves a bit more. And by valuing ourselves, we take care of ourselves a bit more. And it becomes this lovely, you know, I don't mean ever increasing circle. I can't think what the phrase is, you know what I mean? Um, and when we, you know, when we know that we're taking care of ourselves, then actually our, you know, our kind of our value and how we see ourselves increases as well. So, you know, if you cook yourself a really dish, delicious, nourishing meal, not only are you getting the lovely nourishment from the meal, but also you know that you did something nice to yourself. And if you did something good for yourself, that makes you feel a bit taken care of. And you think, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm worth a delicious meal. I'm worth taking care of myself. And then that makes you want to take care of yourself some more. And so then, you know, you think to yourself, well, actually, what is it that I want to do? Do I want to go for a run? Or actually, do I need to get an early night? What is it that feels right for me? I'm not going to go for a run because I think I should do or because I have to or somebody else tells me I should do. But actually, I'm going to go for a run because that is the kind thing to do for myself. Or I'm not going to go for a run because I am exhausted and what I need is my bed and I need to go to bed. And yes, I might sleep for 11 hours, but that's what I need. But it's by taking care of yourself and paying attention to what is it that I need right now, that you can then do what you need to take care of yourself. And that then shows you that you are worth taking care of. It's all this lovely circular thing going on. Absolutely it is. And I think, um, and you may have had the same experience, but, um, I often find that permission to put ourselves at the, anywhere near the top of the list is common in women because we are conditioned that our role is to be the caregiver and to give and not receive. And there is this associated sense of guilt that comes that we have to learn to unhook from, from doing those very simple acts. You know, I've worked with people before who have said things like, um, we talked about a very simple act of self-kindness, um, of drinking enough water throughout the day so they don't have brain fog or headaches. And the language they may use is something like, oh, I, that's so simple, I'm just lazy, I'm just lazy that I don't do that. No, 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 no. That's not what you are. <laughs> it's the fact that you have, you know 110 things on your plate and you've got kids at home and it's locked down and you're trying to do 50 zoom calls a day and you haven't made that simple act of self-care a priority because you haven't valued yourself in that on that list and i think as women that's something that we can really struggle with that kind of guilt that permission over allowing ourselves even the most simplest acts of self-care for one to the better term absolutely yeah i mean that's something that i see in every every woman i work with and that's thing we're talking about simple stuff we're not talking about anything you know mega we're talking about drinking enough water during the day so you don't get a headache mm. but 
it's the you know it's it's the cultural societal messages that we've received all the time we were growing up that you know the generations of women before us received growing up and so we have learned that to be a good girl as defined by society is to put other people first and if you put yourself first you're selfish and that's a very very clear message that we get very early on and you know we have have it reinforced all around us so you know like i never saw my mum sit down unless she was doing something productive she was sitting down if she, she was a teacher so if she was marking or if she was ironing or if she was you know sewing some mending or clothes she was always doing something when she sat you know the phrase you know devil makes work for idle hands that's a phrase that you just remember being around in my life it's not like you know my mum is to blame for why i feel like i need to be doing stuff all the time she was learning from her mum who learned from her mum who learned from her mum this has been going on for generations and so this message is absolutely soaked into our bones for us to have to you know to we have to learn that actually it's okay to be idle if that's what you want to do and that feels revolutionary compared to it's okay if you want to stop for a second and you know go stretch your legs go get a glass of water it's okay for you to do whatever it is for your that your needs are needing you to do right now but that can feel positively revolutionary when we've grown up with this belief that everybody else has to come first and i have to come last when actually there you know there is no queuing system we are all all our needs matter and yes it's a bit of a juggle and yes you know there are people who rely on us but just because people rely on us doesn't mean that our needs are completely and utterly of no value and of no relevance whatsoever because if we don't take care of ourselves we can't take care of other people i mean it's that simple i mean quite often what i what i will start off with talking about this kind of thing because i know it's easier to access is that you can't be the person you want to be in terms of taking care of other people if you don't take care of yourself you know it's just it's just not possible just think about it when you're frazzled when you're worn out when you're stressed when you're knackered what are you like around people you're not very patient are you you know you 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 snap at people you find it really hard to come up with solutions you know you hard, find it hard to to be imaginative you find it hard to, to do any of the stuff so then what are you like when you actually you're rested when you are nourished when you know you are feeling calmer actually you have more patience actually you are able to come up with ideas and solutions you are able to see the funny side of things you know you just enjoy life more and you um you know you're better able to take care of other people so if that's even the first way that you can access this idea of why it is important for you to put your needs first in just relation to other people benefit that's the way in brilliant let's go in through that door and then over time let's also remember that you matter and you are worth you taking care of yes other people get to benefit but actually that's kind of the cherry on the top of the cake here the cake is you and we want you to be taken care of you for yourself and other people get to benefit that's so true it's so true especially the point you make about it being sometimes the only way you can get access initially is through that still that sense that you are serving someone else or someone else is benefiting yeah so i think it's such a it's a deep deep complex as you say it goes to the patriarchy and society and inherited beliefs and our inherited limited beliefs and all of those things um but yeah once you can crack that that um permission over those very simple acts then the the positive chain of events that happen is phenomenal and very quickly i tend to find in that you know people make space they then allow themselves to make space to explore their creativity and you know all the things that are important to them and go back to those values and beliefs that sit at the core of everything we do don't they so yeah phenomenal um so i mean how do you well what do you think are the three most fundamental simple steps that people could take away from this conversation today and put into action that would benefit them um i think noticing your self talk because that voice in our head is loud and powerful um little red flag is the word should so if you're you know if the voice in your head is saying you should do this you should do that you should do this you should do that 
why why what is that first of all you know look at it what should i do could you swap it for could so you know you know you should go for a run i could go for a run suddenly we've swapped from this kind of you know this sort of shaming obligation you really should go for a run i'm telling you to to changing it to could is well now i have the choice back now i get to decide it's not the voice in my head decide now i get to decide what do i want do i want to go for a run yeah, I think I do. Actually, yeah, I think I do want to go for a run. Or, no, no, that's not what I want to do right now. But you get to decide as opposed to this, you know, this sergeant major voice in your head. So I think noticing how you're talking to yourself is a biggie. And then linked to that, I would also say, um, when it's when it's hard to think what to do, you know, well, I don't know, I don't know, I, I should go for a run, but I don't know if I want to go for I don't, ugh, I don't know what to do. Imagine that it's a really good friend of yours in your situation, and this can apply to anything and everything. So if it was a really good friend of yours saying, you know, I don't know, maybe I should go for a run. I don't know what I should do. Should I go for a run? Or I don't know. What would you say to them? You know, you might say, well, you know, what do you think? Would, would having a run feel better? Do you think would that help you get rid of the stresses of the day? Or actually, you know, would it really help for you to just sit on the couch and have a chat with your friend on the phone is that actually what's going to be helpful what do you think you know and and by doing it that way that can help you get a bit more clarity because then actually the answer is going to well, as you're doing this little role play in your head the answer is going to come off of you know what i need to get i need to get out of my system uh, yeah i'm just going to go for running it out of my system and then you just flip that back to yourself all right so in that case i think probably what i want to do is go for a run to get out of my system because it's much easier for us to think of how we can be helpful to a friend than to ourselves because we are that lovely caring person who wants to be of service so we, we you know our brain is much better able to think how can i help this person i will come up with some ideas to help them than it is for how you can help yourself so just flipping it that way can be really helpful for figuring out actually what is the right thing for you to do um and then the the, the third self-care thing which we haven't really touched upon but it's just something that i find really powerful and in terms of habits has become really, over the years, has become a really ingrained habit of mine, and that is my gratitude practice. And there is just so much research behind gratitude practice and how, again, it's one of those things that it sounds really simple, but actually is so powerful. So it's simply writing down three things each day that you're thankful for. And it's not about, you know, it's not about religion. It's not about being, you know, grateful to God for whatever, if that's not your, your cup of tea. It's literally appreciating stuff in your life and it can be the teeniest thing you know i could appreciate i got to drink a whole cup of tea before it went cold okay that is you know that is something i'm really thankful for today you know i appreciate the fact that the sun came out as i went for my walk it can be you know and it can be massive you know i appreciate that you know doctor gave me the all clear it can be huge it can be tiny but by focusing each day for just a minute or two on three things that were good about your day, it allows your brain to focus on the positive. You can't be thinking of a positive and negative at the same time. You can switch between them quick, but you can't do both at the same time. And by doing that, and by making it a daily habit, it means that your brain is being trained to look for the positives. Because as you go through your day, you're thinking, oh, I've got to, I've got to write three things today in my journal, what am I gonna write? And so you're looking, you're actively looking for the good stuff. And there's research that shows that by doing this every day for three weeks, the impact is enormous it it physically you know it lowers blood pressure it lowers your stress level it increases feelings of generosity it, it increases positive emotions and that's just from doing it for three weeks and the, the the kind of the crucial stuff is to do it every day that's going to be far more powerful for you to spend one minute writing down three things a day than if you were to spend half an hour writing down 30 things once a week it's that daily you know and it's making it a habit so i do it um, after I've brushed my teeth and washed my face, when I get into bed, that's when I write in my journal and it's become such part of my habit now. I, it's like, I couldn't go to bed without brushing my teeth. I can't go to bed without writing my gratitude journal. So it's, it's making that a part of your habit and it's such a, a beautifully simple, really powerful little self-care habit that I, yeah, I happily harp on about gratitude practice to anybody who will give me the time of day to listen as you say it's so massively powerful and the fact that our brains are still you know they're still malleable we can begin to tread new goat paths 
as it were you know and i think when we begin to realize actually our you know our, our negative thinking how our brain works and how it serves us up with evidence you know once we fall down that that rabbit hole of oh it's hard and then your brain goes oh we're thinking about things that are hard let me go see what i can find in the filing cabinet to bring to you oh do you remember that time that was hard and you know and then these become the well-worn treks um paths as it were but as you said if it only takes and i didn't know that if it only takes three weeks for that you know a new path to be carved out in our psyche and that that to be such a positive one um that's incredible and it, it's um it says something incredible about the human brain doesn't it about how we can you know it doesn't always have to be that way we can create a new a new way of thinking a better better mindset more positive mindset and something so simple as uh, yeah. you're, you're reminding me i used to do it and i haven't done it for a long time and i'm sat here listening to you going that's it that's what i'm doing tonight <laughs> i'm going to write down in my gratitude to the journal yeah no i'd forgotten how incredibly powerful that can be definitely yeah. and it's and it's only three things i mean you can you write about loads more if you want to but it can just be three things if that's what you want and the, the point of writing it down as well if at all possible is because you write slower than you think and so it takes you so you think about it more because you're writing it down more slowly um it also helps to um fix in your long-term memory better if you write it down plus also you have that written record so if you have had a rubbish week and you get the end of the week and you're just feeling really low it's been really difficult things have not gone well and you just think well there's you know there's nothing nothing good in my life right now there's this has just been a horrible time but you've got your gratitude done you can look back and you can find oh look 21 things that i managed to find that were good about. okay so they're little but there's proof you've got this written evidence if you had the world stage if you could be on top of a mountain talking to everyone or have a billboard that everyone could drive past what's the one thing that you would want to share with everybody so no pressure <laughs> oh, yeah it's just a big just a small thing just a small thing <laughs> it's one nugget of advice for the whole world yeah. um i i would want everybody to know that they have choices that I say, yeah, I'd say you have choices, you have more power and more strength than you think you have, and that you can live the fulfilled, joyful life that you want to live. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. And yes, I hope everyone saw it every morning driving past work and then wanted to get in touch with you so if they wanted to do that how would they go about doing that uh so the easiest place is probably my website where everything lives so that's gabrieltrainer.com not spelt very easily um g-a-b-r-i-e-l-l-e-t-r-e-a-n-o-r.com um so that's where you'll find information on my one-to-one -one coaching um my car mind club membership my pressing pause podcast and all kinds of lovely things um and i'm on instagram as at gabrielle trainer that's my social media of choice my favorite place to be um yeah oh, i have a free facebook group as well called um overcome overwhelm and feel happier but you, know, you can find all of that from my website fabulous yeah. well um i just wanted to say thank you from us here at reframe club for all your wise words today um, I think everyone is going, is going to come away from this feeling more positive and um, hopefully giving themselves a little bit more permission. So yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for tuning in. And we hope you have taken something away from listening. Perhaps one small action you can put into practice today. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's episode, so pop on over to Reframe Club where you can share them, your own reflections and experiences. We would love to hear from you. As always, here at Reframe Club, we are rooting for you.